This episode of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please support us on Patreon over at patreon.com slash geeks or via PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. And I want to give a special thank you to Marcos, who just signed up this week to support us on Patreon. So big thanks again to everyone who's contributed. We really appreciate it. All right, so now let's get to our show. Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 522 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. I'm David Barr Kirtley, author of the book Save Me, Please, and Other Stories, which is available now on Amazon.com. We had a great conversation about the book back in episode 500, so definitely check that out if you missed it. And our guest today is Lori Garver. She served as the Deputy Administrator of NASA from 2009 to 2013, and is known as an architect of the new era of commercial partnerships that allow SpaceX to carry astronauts to and from the International Space Station. She's also the founder of the Earthrise Alliance, a philanthropic initiative using satellite data to address climate change and co-founder of the Brooke Owens Fellowship, an internship and mentorship program for collegiate women interested in pursuing space careers. And in this interview, we'll be discussing Lori's new book, Escaping Gravity, My Quest to Transform NASA and Launch a New Space Age. And now here's our interview with Lori Garver. All right, so we're here with Lori Garver. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It's great to be with you. Okay, and so your new book is called Escaping Gravity. So how'd this book come about? Well, I was the deputy administrator of NASA during a tumultuous time Mm -hmm. uh, in the 2009 to 2013 timeframe. I had come in as the head of the transition team in the Obama administration, and I had come with um, a goal to help transition NASA more fully to uh, the 21st century. We were retiring the space shuttle and didn't have a replacement. So I'm sort of known for... uh, the primary author of the commercial crew program, which is allowing right now uh, SpaceX to be launching astronauts to the space station. And that is the story of my memoir. It did not begin when I was in that NASA position. Um, It started much earlier. And that, however, was a very unique time and a story that I thought uh, needed to be told. Yeah, and it, it's amazing. It's an amazing story. And I definitely, there was a lot about this I didn't know at all. And so talk a little bit about why you wanted this commercial crew program at NASA, because what, what was that um, a response to? NASA was in a position really ever since Apollo of sort of having the goals stated for them by the federal government to reduce the cost of space transportation as you Anyone could imagine, you know, once you can get to space, um, you can do a lot more valuable things. But we were spending so much money to get people and satellites and spacecraft into orbit. Uh, Since Apollo, the calculation is about a billion dollars an astronaut. Spacecraft and satellites uh, that were large were costing $100 million each launch. And reducing that cost was the key to really being able to provide the benefits from the space program that we foresaw in the beginning uh, over 60 years ago. And of course, we know in this country, the way we do that is drive down costs and increase innovation is through competition. And so I had known for 30 years that NASA as a owner and operator of an infrastructure like uh, space transportation was not going to be the most efficient. And we had kept prices artificially high. So when the shuttle was retiring, it seemed obvious to me we would replace it with a competitive system that was um, something that would be led by the aerospace industry. But a lot of people had become wedded to doing it the old way. And so that became the battle. And so for people, for listeners who maybe don't follow the space program that closely, why don't you just talk about what's happened as a result of this commercial crew? Like what have been the developments uh, as a result of this policy that you helped to implement? 
Yes. Well, after the space shuttle program, we, we had, of course, two accidents with the shuttle program that caused 14 astronauts to lose their lives. There were only four orbiters. Initially, we were devastated, the NASA programs, without having this capability. And we were having to buy seats from the Russians for our launches to the space station after the shuttle retired. And what we are now able to do is buy seats from U.S. industry. At this time, SpaceX is the only provider of this service, but we actually awarded two contracts. So Boeing is another company that will be launching astronauts to the space station very soon. And again, where the shuttle was around a billion dollars, an astronaut, the calculation is complex, but we are now paying $55 million a seat for astronauts to SpaceX. NASA's initial estimate was that it saved taxpayers around $20 billion. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 one of the parts that really struck me in your book is when you talk about the difference between going to a SpaceX or a Blue Origin factory versus going to the, the more traditional, you know, Lockheed Martin factories and just the difference in the amount of activity that you would see between the two. Yes, I had been at NASA previously in the 1990s, and we also visited aerospace companies at that time. And I was used to seeing um, a level of work that was, you know, three or four people standing while someone was doing work and they were taking notes, handing them tools and so forth. But the first time I went to SpaceX, when I was the deputy administrator, you'd have one spacecraft with uh, you know, six to eight people working on it in harnesses in different places with their own tool belts. I mean, the pace was incredible compared to the larger aerospace companies. Blue Origin, similar. That is the company that Jeff Bezos uh, owns. It's a space company. And when I went there, they didn't have any government funding, but a huge factory outside of Seattle making um, spacecraft engines or capsule and their plans are all um, to be reusable. And so these systems are just so much more efficient than what the government had. It was obvious to me that something fundamental had to change. And I know that our industry is only competitive internationally if we are um, efficient and effective. And we weren't doing the nation any favors by protecting uh, an outdated program. Right. Now, so I'm a science fiction fan. I'm a science fiction author. And I've interviewed a number of people on this podcast about sort of popular books about the space program and, and about private space flight and stuff like that. Uh, but I was really not aware of, of the sorts of uh, sort of issues inside NASA that, that your book highlights. Do you think that like how widely no is this sort of like, are you exposing this for the first time, or if I was more into the space world, are these things that are kind of more widely known uh, among the people who follow that? Well, it depends on what you're referring to. I think for the most part, people, one of the reasons I wrote the book is that NASA, although it is a public agency and not involved in any type of military national security work by law, uh, it's supposed to be transparent. But decision making hasn't been that way. And as happens with any organization, you know, people in power like to stay that way. Information is power. And so they keep things to themselves. And I came into NASA. This was my second time at NASA. I'd been there in the 1990s for about five years as well. Um, just really being very, very supportive of the agency, but wanting it to do uh, more. We had grown up, I had grown up at a time when the um, space program was really something that showed and demonstrated U.S. leadership. And that was at risk as the space shuttle was retiring for sure. So some of these things are known by hmm. people who follow it more closely, but um, I've actually, I think, revealed some things that even its closest NASA followers um, were a bit surprised to hear. Yeah, well, just to give listeners a flavor of this, I'll just read two lines. So, so at one point you say, 
uh, NASA and industry leadership publicly sign on to deliver programs they favor for unrealistic, unrealistic time frames and budgets, fully aware that they can't deliver. And NASA leaders were typically astronauts and engineers who didn't question the public value or relevance of their activities. Indeed, many considered flying themselves and their friends into space to be an entitlement that shouldn't require justification. Yes, um, that is something that most people actually, this is sort of a self-fulfilling um, prophecy like so many things today. If you follow NASA, it's probably because you support it. And so you aren't, aren't really looking for the negative aspect of it. And there has been so much frustration over the lack of our ability to progress, but people weren't really willing to acknowledge the reason was um, we're, we're all part of the same system. The people making a lot of money on the space program want to keep making a lot of money on the space program. That's sort of natural human tendency. These are companies uh, as well as individuals. And the way to do that is to keep uh, information to yourself and to over promise what it is you can deliver. I mean, this really is not a surprising statement. If you look at post-Apollo, the two human spaceflight programs that NASA has completed, one was the space shuttle promised for $6 billion, cost us over $30 billion to develop, and we ultimately spent over $150 billion flying it. It was supposed to have um, 50 launches a year. The most we ever had was seven. Um, the space station was sold to Congress to be $8 billion. It ended up costing at least $30 billion to develop. We've spent, I think, nearly $200 billion on it now. Annual operations costs $3 billion or more, and it hasn't delivered what it was designed for, which was to um, develop cutting-edge pharmaceuticals that would cure diseases and you know we we over promise and under deliver so here we are again we have a launch vehicle called the space launch system with a capsule called orion they're supposed to go to the moon these were developed by congress and a subset of nasa when i was there in 2009 and 2010 it hasn't launched yet we said it would be 10 billion dollars it's been 20 we said it would be five years. It's been 12. Um, so no, we, I, I just don't believe that the people who designed those programs thought they could do them within those amounts. I think they sold something that they thought someone else would buy and that got their contracts flowing. And then no one wants to cancel contracts because these are jobs in your district uh, and it's all a very cozy operation. Yeah. And so, yeah, so you say that the that by partnering with private industry, it's brought the costs way, way down. And you actually say in the book that now that it's seemed to work out so well, that people are rewriting history to make it as if they were in favor of this all along when really they were fighting you tooth and nail all this time. Like, what's What's that been like for you watching those sorts of turnabouts happen? Well, of course, on one hand, it's fantastic because it means we've succeeded and uh, they are convinced. Um, of course, we would always, I think, as people like people to be honest and it's sort of silly to when you're on the record and these are politicians in general or like the head of NASA at the time um, who were quoted being being opposed to these programs, they are now saying they, not that they were opposed and now they support, they're saying, oh, they created them. <laughs> um, the current head of NASA is the one I'm sure you're speaking of, Administrator Nelson. He was the senator who helped coordinate opposition to the program. But more than that, they really wanted to keep the old way of doing business. And now people, uh, including Administrator Nelson, are saying and recognizing that is not an efficient way to advance the space program. Um, yeah, I mean, sure, I would love it if they acknowledged it weren't, uh, they got new information and made a new determination, and we should all uh, hope to do that. 
it's not anything to be um, ashamed of changing mm. one's mind. Uh, I think it is unfortunate they haven't been more honest about it. Mm-hmm. So take us back. Like, what would you remember the moment when you decided I'm going to write this book? Like, what was that process of actually getting the the words down on the page? Well, I left that uh, NASA round in 2013, and I knew then I wanted to write the story. I had been contacted by a couple of journalists who were interested in writing it and one of my notes, and I had been told by someone, you know, if you want it written um, the way that you viewed this, you're going to have to write it yourself. And I decided to do that really around 2014, but I didn't put pen to paper till more like 2019. And I still don't think we'd have a book now Hmm. if it weren't for COVID. So in May of 2020, like others, as we started recognizing we were going to be on lockdown for quite a while, I took advantage of that time. I used to travel a lot for my job. That was time we could get back. So I think You know, late May of 2020 is when um, SpaceX launched astronauts to the space station for the first time. And you might say, oh, that's a eureka moment. But we I was already writing by then. And and so then what was it like getting a book contract and stuff? Like, did you get an agent or did you had editors reached out to you or what was that like? Well, I, not being a author, didn't quite know how to proceed, got advice, as I usually do from others who have gone before. Um, I actually got an agent right away. And after a month or so with that agent, I realized they were trying to push a book that was different than what I was writing. They were wanting to me to talk about UFOs and oh, what yeah. did I know about aliens? I'm like, Oh no, nothing. That's, that's not going to be the book. Luckily they let me out of that contract. And in the meantime, uh, another agent that I had contacted had since gone into publishing and diversion, diversion publishing is headed by Scott Waxman. He was a former agent. And so I went directly and then didn't use an agent. And that meant I could not only tell the story I wanted to tell, but also get it out within a shorter period of time than several years, which is typical for publishing. So I got really lucky. That's I'm, I'm, I'm still just trying to process this, that this initial agent yeah. wanted you to write about like UFO abduction or like that kind of thing? or uh, It didn't get too much more detail because when I said I had nothing to say about this and this wouldn't be a part of the book um i I think they're looking and i've seen it now you know because i I get a lot of people wanting to interview me and there is a big community out there and when you say you worked at nasa that's they think you have some insight into it yeah that's 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 really funny i mean i am a big uh like i said i'm a big science fiction fan so I do like conversations about aliens and stuff, but I would, yeah, that's that's definitely not what I would expect the uh, NASA. Yeah, NASA and I to and I'm very very open to the concept as well. But of course, if I did have knowledge, I couldn't talk about it. So it's yeah. sort of funny. <laughs> um, because you are actually you're actually a science fiction fan yourself, right? Do you want to talk about that? Well, I did come into my career in space, not as a a science fiction fan. When I came first to Washington, D.C., I worked for Senator John Glenn, and he was running for president. And that's why I was working for him, not because he'd been an astronaut. I got my first job at the National Space Society because of John Glenn. He was on their board. And when I interviewed for the job, I didn't know much about it. But their board included many science fiction authors, including Gene Roddenberry. And that is developed. My relationship with Gene is developed in the book because we did become quite close. He did a lot for the society. He was very um, much a humanist and saw what he was trying to do as, as helping drive our views, not just about space, but about society. And he died while I was expecting my first son. 
He had told me in one of our conversations that he named the character Wesley Crusher to be what he would envision as your perfect son. And uh, my husband and I also liked the name, but he died when we were expecting. And we asked his widow, Majel Barrett Roddenberry, uh, if we could name him after Jean. And so we named him Wesley. So what, what was that conversation like when you was it just a short conversation or did she go into any uh, detail about her feelings or anything like that? Oh, well, I, I even have the letter she wrote in response. And she was here in Washington, D.C. when Wes was eight days old. And that's when we had more of the conversation about it. Um, their son is named Rod Roddenberry. So they hadn't used it. And I think as the character Wesley Crusher developed, she considered him quite precocious, as we all do. And um, I I, I'm not sure I remember her even validating that character was something that Gene would consider his perfect son, but he had said it to me. <laughs> so, so, so is, so, so is Wes your son? Is he a perfect son? Did he live up to that? <laughs> of course, of course. He is a humanist, and at first he would really um, didn't love the Star Trek reference for his <laughs> name. But later, as he learned more about it, he embraces it fully. He does go by West, not Wesley. And um, he's a composer and a musician and uh, very much wanting to use that to advance social change the way I think Gene was um, using his tools through the series. There's this really interesting uh, scene in the book where your son has this conversation with Elon Musk. Can you tell us about that? Yes. Uh, Wes graduated from college uh, in 2014 and Elon had, and SpaceX had brought their first variant of their dragon um, crew carrier to Washington, D.C. with a big event. So I had Wes with me and Elon had wanted to have a talk with me. He sent for me. I said, I'm bringing my son. He was a week out of college. As I introduced him to Elon, Elon and I had been talking about the capsule and I had noted um, the pilot, the, the pilot's in it and he had said you know i only have a stick in there for nasa because all this will actually be automated when he asked wes what his major was and wes said music composition elon says oh that's another profession that's just going to be completely automated uh i of course thought this was extremely rude thing to say to a college a recent college graduate i mean he graduated that week um but Wes took him on and explained why he thought that wasn't the case, you know, using the um, reasons like we have our own human element we put into it. And there are things that um, are unique. And Elon didn't agree, said that could be written into the software. This went on for a little bit before Wes said, you know, I think we sometimes resonate with the composer. I mean, would a Dylan song be a Dylan song if we didn't know Bob Dylan wrote it? To which Elon paused and then nodded and said, uh, I, I, I agree. I hadn't thought about that. So this is forever in our household, you know, <laughs> known as the day Wes, um, at, at, I think he was 22, um, convinced the genius Elon Musk of something. Yeah, I thought that was such an interesting story because it shows both that, that Elon is sort of sort of difficult. You know, you say this is sort of a rude comment that he made, but also that he can be swayed by just sort of a logical argument and is willing to change his mind and admit that he's changed his mind, which is sort of a uh, a, a quality that's not as common as it as it should be. Yes. And that is why I included it in the book. I say in the book, I was proud of them both. I mean, not that Elon cares, but I'm proud of them. <laughs> but um and this is carried on by, by Elon throughout my time knowing him. That's been 20 years now, but um, he really doesn't come across as em empathetic. That's not his reason for making decisions. Um, he 
however, takes in information and makes decisions. He's not just got, I think this, you know, I, my view, no matter what. And I think that's probably really helped um, in his success. I'd never heard, there's a story in your book I'd never heard before that Elon decided he was going to start, sort of made the plunge, decided to make the plunge to start his own rocket company when he was in Russia and a engineer spat on his shoe. It seems like such a weird thing to have happened. Yes, it's such a weird thing to have happened. And a couple people have written about it. Um, I have not talked to Elon directly about it, but it's confirmed in several of the biographies. And I did meet him right after that. So it's well known that Elon was trying to get a launch for an experiment that he wanted to send to Mars and a biology, uh, biological thing, because his goal was always to populate Mars. And the Russians were rude to him. I knew they'd been rude to him. But one was uh, spit on his shoe. And Elon was so incensed. He was coming back in the plane. And people who were with him said he decided on the way back, I'm going to start a rocket company despite these. Of course, it's not just the spitting. It's because it was so expensive. Here, he couldn't get a launch in the U.S., um, below hundreds of millions of dollars. And clearly the Russians were, I, I don't know the figures, but also charging him more than he thought was reasonable. And it's fascinating because there had been a lot of even wealthy individuals trying to start rocket companies in the 90s, and they hadn't been successful. And I know Elon got some advice. Oh, don't try to run at the launch um, industry Everybody tries and fails. Um, Well, thank goodness he did, because space transportation is the key to being able to do anything else in space, as I was saying uh, earlier. Uh, And if if SpaceX hadn't lowered the launch costs, it's it's unclear whether we would even um, well, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Hmm. We didn't get a lot of um, competitive bids for the commercial crew program. As I said, Boeing received uh, one of these contracts for nearly twice the amount of SpaceX. And now it's been over two years since SpaceX has been launching and Boeing's yet to do it. Hopefully they will do it by the end of this year, early next year. Well, yeah. I mean, when you think about how different the course of history could have been, I mean, there's a line in the book where you say, speaking of Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos, you say both men attribute their interest in space to reading science fiction as boys. And you just think about just if those two particular people hadn't been into science fiction, if they'd been into something else uh, as a kid, how much different the course of history would have been. Yes. Yes. Uh, So many things. Um, I I mean, a lot of people are very much inspired by science fiction, and this has been happening for years. I I would include Werner von Braun. I cite in the book, um, it's a podcast, Moonrise, that was done for the 50th anniversary of Apollo that really gets into the early science fiction authors and how they inspired so so many of the space leaders in the 19... 50s and 60s. So it's been a really important element of the science that has um, transpired in space since, and I think continues to be inspiring to people. As I say in the book, that does, and certainly in the early days, especially tend to be boys. And I was not one of those people initially, just, you know, watching Star Trek when I was a kid. Um, or reading a bunch of science fiction. There, we focus on, I think, a lot of the more um, masculine-driven science fiction, some of it misogynistic. But I recently received the Heinlein Award, the Robert Heinlein Award. And I think the it's it was started 34 years ago, and I'm the first woman to have received it. So these, these are early days for, I think, um, having a more diverse um, interest and achievements in our space program. And some of that has to do with science fiction. Did you ever, like, can you can you think of any women that you met in 
in government or, or science or anything who are big science fiction fans who people maybe don't know that they're big science fiction fans? Huh. Um, no. You know, my my role models and mentors like Sally Ride were not. Um, I don't believe that that is a similar um, inspiration. I mean, it could be, but it's not something anyone has shared with me. Hmm. That's interesting. So you think that, that women tend to be drawn for, for different reasons than, than reading Robert Heinlein? Huh? Yeah, and I think Robert Heinlein and Star Trek, for that matter, you know, objectified women. And so why... I mean, how exciting we get to be in a story only as someone's plaything. You know, that's not exactly our goal. Um, so I think it has to do somewhat with the science fiction itself. Um, and I think women tend to go into fields where they feel they can really make a positive difference for humanity. And until we saw ourselves doing that through roles like engineering um, and science, we didn't go into them. We still have, I think it's certainly less than 30% of aerospace engineers are women, whereas medical school is over 50% female. You know, a couple of months ago, we reviewed Robert Heinlein's novel, The Moon is a Harsh Mistress. Mm -hmm. And we had to say, you know, in the first five minutes of the show or something, just that the female characters are not good in this book. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just exactly. get, that, get that out of the way right, right off the bat. Exactly. And um, I didn't know Heinlein. A lot of people I know did. I think um, that tracks. Have you, have you read The Moon is a Harsh Mistress? Um, at least 20 years ago, yes. Okay. Because I because you <laughs> you mentioned in the book uh, I'd written a paper in because I'll say if people don't know that the premise of the story is it's about there's a colony on the moon that uh, revolts and uh, declares independence from Earth. Um, and, and so you say in the book I'd written a paper in grad school about the social and economic social and economic implications of a lunar base. I was just curious uh, what are the social and economic implications of a lunar base. Well, sure. So this was in grad school. It was a master's degree in international public policy, science and technology policy. So really the take was as um, we expand humanity and develop a lunar base, you would want to do it in such a way that there were things you were doing on the moon that could benefit our economy um, we have felt for a long time there could be ways to mine nutrients, including potentially water, including potentially helium-3, um, things that would be worthwhile to do on a lunar base, um, value to society as well as our economy. How about this? You said this, the social, what would be the social implications of a lunar base? Well, that's, that's a good point. I didn't get into Heinlein at that time. We weren't thinking of making it a penal colony, or uh, but it's really being able to, I think this is a very U.S.-centric view, to carry on our values um, as we expand into space is something a lot of us care about when we say, oh, you know, we wanted to beat the Russians. I know we were very focused on showing the world that democracies were a better way to advance science and technology. But it's also now in our race uh, that we like to say we're having with China to go back to the moon, we want to carry on humanist values. We want to have the ability to have a base be um, positive, equal, diverse, and allow us I think there's some sense of a science fiction utopian societies. You know, we want to free ourselves from whatever it is here on Earth that's governing us that doesn't allow us um, to live the lives that we want to. Uh, that is somewhat the societal implications. When you mention, uh, you know, the the race with the Russians and stuff, that makes me think of the quote in the book where it's John F. Kennedy. And he says that in private, he says, you know, if we can't beat the Russians, there's no point in even trying. I'm not that interested in space. And it's like yes. so, so different from uh, the public image uh, that you have of them. 
Yes. And, you know, people have known about that quote for uh, over a decade. I think those files are released something like 50 years um, later that we have the system of archives and people have been writing about that quote within the space community, but of course, try to ignore it because <laughs> you, you, you even got get historians saying, well, you know, he came back from that as we saw when he visited NASA, you know, because he did visit NASA just a week, I think before, maybe it was even the same trip uh, where he was killed in Dallas, um, that he was coming around. Uh, there's, there's a whole um, school of thought that says if he'd have lived, we wouldn't have continued with the program. You know, it was um, something that when he died, Lyndon Johnson had been a very strong supporter of the space program before he was vice president when he was in the Senate. Um, being from Texas, the Johnson Space Center is named after him for his support. And he was able to continue it sort of as, you know, something that a martyred president wanted. And that really helped the program. I wanted to ask about this. So so uh, you say, you know, speaking of that that time period, you say longing to create the future they envisioned scientists, bureaucrats and science fiction writers, several of whom would become future colleagues, provided quixotic, unrealistic testimony about the expectations of space exploration. And so it's kind of like there is maybe like a role for uh, exaggeration or something if if space exploration is something that's really important to you. Yes, from the beginning. And again, it worked. Um, I mean, who can say no? Uh, it goes on from there. You know, Lyndon Johnson said we could control the weather from space. There's, of course, Reagan's whole um, Star Wars strategic defense initiative that's the high ground militarily. Um, much of it you know, is true in the sense that it is a very unique perspective from which you can do a lot of very worthwhile things um, like communication, earth observation, geopositioning, and so forth. But it isn't going to ever fulfill the kinds of things that have been promised even from the early days and from science fiction. Of course, science fiction never said this is going to happen. It's people who understandably, see something that they think they can make a contribution to and try and get money to do it and get as far as they can. Well, let, let me read this Lyndon Johnson quote. He says, this is in a speech, I think. He says, control of space means control of the <laughs> world. From space, the masters of infinity will have the power to control the Earth's weather, to cause drought and flood, to change the tides and raise the levels of the sea, to divert the Gulf Stream and change temperature climates to frigid. Uh, all of which that would really come in handy right now if we could do that. Yes, stuff. if only, <laughs> if only. That is, just, it was just such a uh, classic Lyndon Johnson quote, and um, it he held hearings that lasted for months and ended with the um, creation of NASA as a public space agency. But the people who put those hearings together, including Lyndon Johnson, had wanted it to be a cabinet department. Um, it was Eisenhower who managed to evolve a previous um, government organization called the NACA, Nas Nas National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, into NASA to expand its reach to include space. And that kept it at least from being a cabinet or agency, which I think Eisenhower felt this this could really, he considered what we were doing in space to be a bit of a distraction from the actual national security uh, that he felt was very important against the Soviet Union. So, so, so when, when Johnson is saying we'll be able to do all this stuff, is that just salesmanship or were there people at the time who thought, was that based in any kind of projections or science or anything at the time? Oh, I'm sure it wasn't. These were <laughs> uh, speeches that staffers wrote. Many, many of the staffers who I ended up knowing. I worked for Glenn Wilson at the National Space Society, and his he he worked on the committee on those hearings, which is how I got first interested in it. Um, but 
No, it's not. It's not any more reality, frankly, than some of what we talk about doing today. So, so what what do we talk about doing today that you think is sort of equally fanciful? Uh, Fifty million people colonizing Mars, <laughs> perhaps. That's. Uh, I'll, I'll explain. So, so Elon Musk, I guess, has said that he yes. is planning to have. Uh, 1 million people on Mars by the year 2050. So you're, you're not betting, you're not betting money that that's going to happen. I I am not betting money that that is going to happen. Um, the challenges are, are real. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. Um, and just like Lyndon Johnson's comments, you know, they're, hard to disprove and you don't get any points for being a naysayer at this point. I have been very supportive of um, the efforts of, of SpaceX and these other companies. I believe that expanding humanity beyond uh, the earth is over the long term something we must do to survive. Um, But I also think that we have only a few generations here on this planet to survive um, and that's not enough time to <laughs> be creating um, plan B or, you know, a whole self-sustaining civilization elsewhere. What I have said about that is I, I know there's some movies with this um, narrative, but, you know, it's always going to be easier to fix our problems here on Earth than it is to colonize a whole nother place um, that. I don't think we should give up here. And I know that Elon isn't saying we should, but for, um, I think the prioritization, the role that we have today is to make sure that we are around long enough as a society and humanity being in a position to survive over the long term means we have to survive here first. You're talking about climate change? Yes. Yeah. I mean, climate change is the driver, but the implications of it are are so vast with conflict, um, you know, having, um, as you said, if we could do the things that Lyndon Johnson said, we'd be better off if we could keep drought and uh, weather, if we could be masters of the universe, that would be a different thing. But I don't see us having the ability to mass um, produce the kinds of things that we say that we would need to have a self-sustaining colony um, as quickly as Elon. I think over a longer term, that's a very hopeful future. Um, So it's not a negative thing. It's just a timing thing. Mm Mm-hmm. I mean, in the book, you mentioned this technology, this sort of perspective technology called Vasimir, uh, an electrothermal thruster, which could theoretically reduce the time needed to get to Mars from eight months to six weeks. Is that uh, coming up anytime soon? It's not. <laughs> that is the kind of technology that, that, for instance, SpaceX not even considering in their one million people. Um any transit time to Mars, if you're going to stay in Mars, is still a big question about how are you going to manage radiation? Um, you know, there's no air to breathe. So are you going to, what kind of structures are you going to live in? That kind of thing. Um, we do not know how people can survive for those long durations outside of the protection of our Van Allen radiation belt. We don't know um, how to transit in a way that allows people not to be radiated on the way. Um, It's a big challenge. There's a lot of big challenges there. Actually, speaking of Mars, you know, you mentioned in the book, uh, Andy Weir's novel, The Martian. Yes. And I interviewed Andy back in, I think it was around 2015. but, But around that time, there was this Washington Post article and the headline was, Andy Weir and his book, The Martian, may have saved NASA and the entire space program. I was just curious if you ever uh, heard of that or what you thought about I that. didn't see the article, but of course, I mean, the book and movie um, are 
are the types of science fiction that connect some more reality than things like The Moon is a Harsh Mistress. And a lot of people had really good things to say about the science in that. There's also, of course, people who um, point out the disconnects, uh, and there were many of those, but it did light a fire at NASA with the public support for doing bold things like sending someone to Mars. And of course, sending someone to Mars like that's very different than a million people going to Mars. I think we will go to Mars with people um, in in my lifetime and I'm 61 years old. So um, the, the connection to, again, science fiction, it's really important. And I think a certain segment of the public finds it very inspiring. Yeah, actually, getting going back to global warming too. You you mentioned in the book this technology called Omega that would uh, sort of use uh, algae to grow uh, airplane fuel, basically, and it would, in a sort of ecologically sustainable way. And yes. you you sort of pushed for it, and it, and you were kind of your efforts were kind of scuttled. But I was just curious, uh, kind of what are the future prospects for that sort of technology? Yes, I have kept in touch with them. And the idea here was the um, technology innovation was a membrane that you would put in um, sort of the waste and it would float up in the ocean. And so the motion naturally of the waves through this membrane would um, separate it into freshwater and fuel. Then Navy did take this on, um, not exactly the same intellectual property, but a lot of work has been done to utilize waste and utilize membranes to separate out wastewater um, into fuel and fresh water. And it's a really exciting um, technology. Yeah, no, that sounds really cool. I, I I would love to see more happen with that. And and also, aren't you involved with um, like the Earthrise Alliance or something like that? That that sort of could could you talk about that? Like, do do it working somehow to help uh, climate change and, and that sort of thing? Sure, I founded a project um, twenty nineteen called Earthrise Alliance, and we really exist just to utilize existing satellite data about planet Earth to address the climate crisis. So right now, our big project, we call it Climate Trace, and we are using satellite imagery and machine learning to identify greenhouse gas emissions in pretty close to real time around the planet, and we map those. So these very smart people who do this, I do not do it. I raise money for the project (laughs) and help um, connect it so that it can make a difference. For instance, our climate envoy, Secretary Kerry, took these maps um, in Cantonese to China or negotiations to show that you really can't hide. You know, we are going to need this information if we are going to be able to validate trade agreements and so forth. Um, a lot of this is also just showing change locally. So things like drought, you can very easily through satellite imagery imagery show how your local landscape has changed. Um, Ice, ponds, lakes, et cetera. And we work with journalists to get that information out. And um, that is the project. Yeah, that that sounds really cool. I I heard you say in an interview, I think, something like 80% of our data relevant to fighting climate change comes from outer space, that if we didn't have this capacity to to put up all these satellites that, that we would really be, you know, yes, with one of hand course. Back. not, not all of that is NASA. NASA's role is to drive the technologies for these satellites. We have NOAA, the national oceanographic and atmospheric administration who does a lot of this work and the private sector, but from satellites, we, it's the only place we can get consistent um, data that is global and the measurements of the interactions between the water, the ice, land, and atmosphere are what we model. And of course, all that data is um, 
utilized in association with in situ data here on earth with buoys and measurements that way. But it is the satellite data. Whenever you see these maps, you don't really think about where they come from. I know we have a funny um, thing we say here about member of Congress saying, why do we need these satellites when we have the weather channel? (laughs) But, um, you know, they usually do say NASA in the corner or NOAA. The climate ones say NASA because those are our scientists. But those measurements come from satellites. Yeah, that's so cool. Um, So what's it been like having the book come out? Have you gotten... Like what sort of response has it gotten? Or have you heard from readers or gotten reviews or anything like that? Sure. I'm very pleased. I guess we're just one month in from its release. And it has um, nearly five stars, four point something on, on Amazon. And I'm surprised at the positive response and the lack of a negative response. I don't know if people are just biding their time, <laughs> that's something yet to come. But I haven't heard from from the people in in the book who maybe, you know, might be seen as the antagonist to my story. Um, there have been no comments given by some of those people when media call them for, for articles, but it's gotten great coverage. The publisher is happy with the sales. And I'm relieved because I did tell a very honest some would say brutally honest (laughs) story about um, an agency that I do love. And my line there is, you know, if you have a loved one who's an alcoholic, you don't just serve them drinks. You work to help um, get them better. And that's my goal here is to make NASA better. It isn't to point out its problems. It's to say, we have done this thing at NASA. They we're able to embrace change, which is very hard in a government system. Um, Not all of NASA is yet changed, and there are many programs in the government that could benefit from some of this tough love. I mean, I thought that was one of the most striking takeaways from the book is that opposing you, you have all these people who are you know, many of them incredibly smart, incredibly accomplished, you know, rocket scientists and astronauts. And, you know, and, you know, they're, they're as smart and as accomplished as it's possible for a person to be. But, you know, having being that smart and that accomplished doesn't necessarily make you right on every political issue. And it's possible to, you know, have these public policy issues where being a rocket scientist doesn't necessarily make you right. You know, like someone who's studied public policy might actually have more insight into into the situation than than a, a literal rocket scientist. Yes, but, you know, it's even deeper than that because it's people who don't even recognize that NASA needs to have a policy reason to exist, you know? It was really interesting. Neil Armstrong and Jim Lovell, who uh, Gene... Cernan, all, as you say, just experts in their field, they're not experts in public policy, but come on, you're testifying in Congress saying that that these things we propose are going to ruin NASA without even thinking about the problems that we've been having and why we've been having them. So I, it was very disappointing to me, and I don't think they were doing it for the wrong reasons, but it tends to be very stovepipe. People come to NASA who are engineers and scientists. They don't have any kind of background in public policy or economics, and they don't really see why that matters. They did such a good job with the early space program with Apollo. That's why I use the entitlement word. I know it sounds terrible, but there's no other way to describe it. I would I would sometimes ask, well, why are we doing this or that for these astronauts? And they're like, well, Obviously, we they're astronauts. You know, we want to walk on the moon. I grew up wanting to walk on the moon. Like, okay, but does the public owe you that? Um, not questions they were used to hearing, nor did they like to hear them. I want to ask you, in the, in the intro, you say memoirs, or maybe this is the afterword, you say memoirs by former NASA political leaders are conspicuous in their absence. I was just curious, why do you think there haven't been more books like, like this one? Yeah, I've given it a little thought. Um, I Again, I think most people in those roles are engineers, um, not really focused on communications or lessons learned kind of things to a broader public. I think there have been the 
writings of um, scientific articles or something. And there's also a clubby atmosphere. And it's a bit of a, you know, first rule of fight club, don't talk about fight hmm. club. Um, these, I, I, I'm breaking the rules for sure by speaking out on Un, unwritten rules. Hmm. Well, that that's good though, that, that so far it's, uh, you know, hasn't been too much drama. So yeah, hopefully that'll yeah, continue. Yeah. I, I did see Charlie Bolden this weekend, this last weekend, and, um, it didn't come up. He's, uh, undoubtedly he's told people who again have, asked him for comment, but no comment. I'm sure, um, I'm not sure he'll read it. <laughs> uh, I also just wanted to ask you, you said that at one point your publisher considered titling this The Space Pirates. And I was just curious, uh, could you talk about why why they considered titling that and why they went with the current title instead? Sure. When I pitched the book, I titled it Billionaires and Bureaucrats, The Race to Save NASA. When the publisher bought it, they immediately said they wouldn't call it that and reserve the right to call it what they wanted, which I, I, publishing is such a crazy business. Um, you don't get to title your own memoir. Um, but they promised we'd talk about it. So their working title was Space Pirates. And for, as you know from reading the book, Space Pirates are what I call the sort of long time, really probably largely – um, inspired by science fiction, hmm. people who care about going out into space over the long term and sustaining civilization. Um, they are the people who go, whether it's the legal regime is set up for them to do it or not, they're going to mine the asteroids, you know? And I think the publisher actually thought that space pirates were how I was describing Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, um, they are space pirates, but they're very late to the game. I was talking about space pirates that started decades before. Um, I kept pushing for a different title, especially when they came up with a cover that looked to me like teenage science fiction. Um, <laughs> and they did uh, get a response from their sales teams that the book was terrific, but they thought the title and cover did not give convey the message of the book, the serious message message of the book, they came back and said, so we want to call it breaking barriers. I said, um, okay, can I work on that? <laughs> <laughs> and I came up with escaping gravity. And by then it was late in the game and they said, fine. Yeah. Cause breaking barriers could be a book about literally anything. That's exactly what I said. That's exactly what I said. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Do they just with billionaires and bureaucrats, do they just think bureaucrats is a is going to be a boring people are going to think it's boring to read about bureaucrats or I don't know why they didn't like that title. Most people who heard that title liked it. Neil deGrasse Tyson, who has one of the pull quotes on the cover, uh, told me I, he preferred that. Um, you I, I do not know. I do not know how they um, make these decisions. It's just, it's just funny, you know, with with that initial agent who wanted it to be about aliens, and then the publisher wanted it to, you know, yeah, space piracy, yeah. you know, that maybe it, this, this gives us some clue as to why there aren't more books uh, like this uh, out there. Yes, that is an excellent point, and the, really the only reason I think mine was marketable because there aren't many books written, as I said, from leaders at NASA. They tend to be, you know, astronaut biographies, um, and they did say that female authors do better. The readers of books these days are, are women actually in my demographic. Yeah. Well, I'm certainly glad that the book came out because it was, a, like I said, it was a really fascinating read for me and insight into this, this world that I, I really didn't know anything about. Um, and, and yeah, like you say, like there's all sorts of uh, uh, interesting conflicts and char colorful characters and stuff for people to, uh, to enjoy. Um, Indeed, and we're we're all out of time. So, do you have any just any other final thoughts or any other uh, projects you want to let people know about? No, I'm uh, happy to have the conversation. It was uh, interesting to hear your take, and I think you you really tread some new ground with uh, the science fiction. Maybe I'll write that next. 
Yeah, you're going to write some science fiction next? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, well, I'm always, yeah, everyone uh, who doesn't write science fiction on this show, I'm always encouraging them. Yeah, why don't yeah. you think about writing some science fiction? So I, I'd, and I'd, I I'd could really see. tell the stories and change the names. Yeah. Well, and then you could have like a, a, a science fiction book about a NASA deputy administrator <laughs> who gets abducted by space pirates. Oh, and yeah. The, the publishers and agents will love, will love that. I was always trying to get on the Big Bang Theory in that with, with my role as deputy because we were able to get astronauts on there. But they never, they never thought the deputy administrator should be on there. That's too bad. Because yeah, if people read the book, they'll they'll see that you almost had a big TV career as well. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Well, I'll, yeah, all, all sorts of stuff, all sorts of really interesting stuff in the book. That unfortunately we don't have time to go into all of it. That's a good teaser. <laughs> but yeah, everyone definitely uh, hope you're hopefully you're curious to check out this book. And again, it's called Escaping Gravity by our guest today, Lori Garver. So, Lori, thank you so much for joining us. You're most welcome. Thank you for having me. And that was our interview. So big thanks again to Lori Garver for joining us on the show. This episode of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy was made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please support us on Patreon over at patreon.com slash geeks or via PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. All right, so that was our show. So thanks everyone for listening. And we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarkertley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.